Yeah, guten Tag. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Unfortunately, I can't see you all because we are a little bit blinded by the light here, but I hope that you can see us all the better. Today, we will be discussing philosophy in Islam, which to our view is a very lively and living history. And our guests are Professor Dr. Frank Riffel, who teaches at Oxford today, who used to be a professor for religious studies at Yale. At Oxford, he is the professor for Abrahamic religions. And he was awarded the Sheikh Zayed Award, a major cultural award from Abu Dhabi in the category Arabic culture in other languages. Frank Riffle was awarded the prize for his book, The Formation of Post-Classical Philosophy in Islam, which, however, he wrote in English. We hope that we will soon have a German translation, a German version, anyway, of the book. Frank Riffle, for many years, if not decades, has been an expert for Islamic philosophy, but also theology, and how both are related, we will discuss in a minute. And on the panel, we also have um, Ahmed Milad Karimi, who is a professor of Islamic philosophy. Falsafa Kalam, that is a philosophy a theology and mystic at the University of Münster, where he is also the deputy director of the Center for Islamic Theology. He, Frank Riffel, uh, besides the Sheikh Zayed Award, has won other prizes, which would be too many to um, list. Ahmad Milad Karimi won the Franz Gerges Prize of the Friends of Abraham, which fits uh, perfectly in with the um, professorship for Abrahamic religions, which Frank Riffle received in Oxford just now. For those of you who don't understand German. We have an, we have an English translation. Um, Therefore, please get the receivers for the simultaneous interpretation. This event and this session is being funded, and thank you very much, by Sheikh Zayed Book Award and by the Arabic Language Center associated with the award, here represented by Zayed Tunaiji and um, Abdul Rakhman Najami. Thank you very much for the funding, and thank you very much for organizing the event. Well, the event was actually organized by Litrom, which is the association that is part of Frankfurt Book Fair for promoting non-European literatures. And I am Stefan Weidner. I am a translator, an author, and a journalist. Frank Riffle, your book, The Formation of Post-Classical Philosophy in Islam, sounds like a work of religious history. But on the other hand, it sounds like a work of history and of philosophy. We have Islam on the one hand and philosophy in the West here. This field is known to just a few people. Even professors of philosophy don't exactly know what that is all about. Man, what is the history that your book tells? What is that formation of post-classical philosophy in Islam? Could you put this in a nutshell? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the friendly invite, Mr. Weidner, and for the kind introduction. Well, the book I wrote is basically a history of a philosophy in Islam starting in the 12th century and lasting until the middle of the 13th century. It's about philosophers who lived back then about what they were thinking and what they thought exactly. However, at this point, I would like to explain the direction of the book. The book is against, the rights against the idea that in Islam, philosophy during the 12th century 
kind of submerged, which is a widespread opinion held by many in the Western culture and also by many Arab and Islamic scholars. But I think that this misunderstanding is based on two impressions that we hold on Islam in the West, but also in the Arabic world, which I question in my book. Well, the one thing is this, that religions always behave in the same way, especially when it comes to the conflict between believing and knowing on the one hand. And this affects the history of Christendom, of um, Judaism in the West. And we think and we assume that it's a pretty much the same in Islam, which is not true. And then in the second place, uh, there is the idea that in Islam, um, in the early ages, things used to be better than later on, which um, surfaces when we read about Islam, when we write about Islam, there is a general assumption that there used to be a golden age of Islam. However, if in each and every situation we keep speaking of a golden era, of a golden period, this also means that there has been a decline after the end of that golden age. And these two aspects I question with my book. First, I believe that the relationship between belief and um, the, um, um, science has been different. And I think that the decline after the so-called golden age, and in my book, you could call it classical Islam. So basically that in the post-classical period, between um, 1100 and 1150, so that in the post-classical period, there has been no decline of classical philosophy. That is very interesting to know in order to dig a little bit deeper, let me ask the following question. Isn't there that kind of competition or wasn't there that kind of competition between religion and philosophy as it existed in the Christian Middle Ages? And as you would assume, uh, generally speaking, that it used to be the same in Islam, is this a total myth? Or how do you see the relationship between philosophy and Islam, which is interesting for you because you teach comparative uh, religious studies, but also write philosophical books? Well, it's not a myth. Of course, we are aware of the philosophical tradition where we assume that it started out in Greece with the priest Socrates, with the Socrates. Socrates, um, um, Plato, and Aristotle, the three um, key philosophers. And this develops and is taken up by Islam in the 8th, 9th, 10th um, century. This is translated into Arabic from Greece and develops its own life, basically. So basically, and actually, there was kind of a conflict. There was a kind of a friction. when it comes to the, um, the basic principles of Islam, so based on the revelation uh, emanating from the revelations of um, Islam and uh, the hadiths of the Prophet. But what is really interesting in my view is that the conflict between the two traditions, you could say on the one hand, uh, between the tradition of philosophy and the tradition of theology in Islam, that this conflict developed differently from how it developed in the West, also because in the West, the conflict was very much institutionalized. Uh, from the beginning of the um, establishment of universities, we had two faculties in the Western world, the theology faculty and the artists faculty with the philosophy, the f departments of the arts that started with the Bologna in the 12th century, with Paris and many other universities later on. Later, this uh, dichotomy continues inside the universities, like during the Enlightenment, and even today, to name just a few examples, at almost all German universities, we have uh, faculties for theology, um, evangelical, Catholic theology, and uh, now even Islamic and uh, Jewish theology in a few selected universities. And um, apart from that, we have the so-called secular sciences, where um, the philosophy developed. 
This is a very institutionalized development. And when we ask what does theology do, what does philosophy do, we look at what the professors do and uh, what they teach at those uh, departments. And in Islam, there has never been such a separation. That is, the institutions of higher education in the period I look at in the post-classical period, especially concerning the madrasas there, both theology, they, they teach both theology and the philosophy. And what is really, really interesting and exciting and what I found, found out in my book is that um, both disciplines are taught sometimes by the very same people, by the same persons. That is, in the post-classical period, we have uh, Islamic scholars who are active and who write and work on the theology very actively and that even draw important conclusions. And then they write books about philosophy, where they, re where they develop the same topic. And interestingly, they draw different conclusions that um, in part contradict the conclusions from the other department. This is a conflict I've worked a lot on, from which I have drawn my very own conclusions in my book. So this is kind of well, not always a peaceful, but um, the practiced coexistence, sometimes inside one and the same person, which you made very clear. Therefore, now my question to Milad Karimi, who wrote an important book um, on uh, 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 Islamic philosophy, Licht über Licht, is the title of his book, published in 2021. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, it was published in uh, 2021. So basically, I would like to pass the question on to you now. What do you think about uh, this competition between religion and philosophy? Is there something like that? Does this like characterize, um, affect your own work? Does it somehow um, handicap you? There is a quotation from your book. Um, there is a very nice quotation that I really like. And you said, the opening up of Islam for the, um, the philosophical is not um, does not mean a, a foreign late addition to which religion can relate affirmatively or negatively. Rather, it is the beginning. Rather, the beginning of philosophy is the other beginning of Islam in the first place. So basically, to you, Islam and philosophy cannot be splitted. Yes, exactly. And I learned this especially through the Islamic tradition itself in the first place. If we start from the very first philosophy, Al-Kindi philosophies in the Islamic context, if you want to learn from Al-Kindi in Al-Falsafa Al-Hula, in his main work, so the work on, his, uh, on philosophy, on the very first page, he writes that philosophy is the most noble of all sciences because a philosophy is about uh, a strife for truth. And in Quran, we read more than twice that um, God, uh, the, the eternal, identifies with truth. And we have known from antiquity in knowledge it's about truth with no compromise. And this is exactly what um, I believe in religion uh, devoutly. It is about um, striving for God, uh, coming closer to the divine, because knowledge is one name of God. And therefore, um, the philosophy, well, um, Hegel might put it like that later on, philosophy is a service paid to God because it's um, a work on truth. It's tried, trying to elaborate the truth. So what is practiced in philosophy, and the Muslim philosophers made that very clear, is basically that well, you are devote not just by praying, but also by using your intellect. So if we try on, or well, rather, how would you define the relationship between Islamic philosophy and uh, theology? Is there a clear demarcation? Is there a clear separation? Or are both very much intertwined? As we might know, 
um, as we might say, about Christian or um, another theology. I think the truth is somewhere in between. While they are both intertwined, there are topics that, that are interested for both Buddha Kalimun, but also the philosopher and later the others um, that treat a similar topics in a very controversial way and in a very in the contrary way. However, from a genuine a philosophical point of view, there is the instance of revelation and basically the instance of authentic traditions, as they are called later in the tractates, and which we would call intellect or reason. So basically, if a philosopher in his philosophy um, was proposing an authoritarian um, element, which is true because the prophet said it, I would contradict my very own principles. And this we don't come across very much, but rather, and I find this uh, more interesting, the prophet said it because it's true. It is written in the Quran because it's true and not it's true because it's uh, written in the Quran. This makes it easy if, uh, for us uh, so we can say everything. And if somebody has questions, I can say, OK, it's written in the Iran. But that doesn't help anyone because um, Islam is um, not like a sectarian a movement convincing only a few. No, Islam wants to be a universal message for everybody, for the humankind. In order to be able to do this, the religion, the message needs to be communicable, and this needs to be assured. And to this, uh, the theologians and philosophers contribute. OK, basically, so you place the focus, or you shift the focus from the pure religious truth, which is believed because it has been revealed. Um, you shifted to truth in itself. Frank Griffel, well, the bigger protagonist, basically, of all of your studies. You also um, did some translations. And um, one um, the main focus of your work is uh, Al-Ghazali, who died in the 11th century, a major um, um, a f philosopher, theologian, and maybe also a dogmatic it's a personality, it's a scholar. One can be divided about. And um, he also argued with a lot of other philosophers and theologians. What kind of a person was he? Who was he? What makes him so important? Well, Al Ghazali, I have to mention that first, is one of the key scholars of Islam. If you asked who are the major five thinkers of Islam, his name would be among them. I don't know if he is in the top three. Well, you might argue about this. Al Ghazali, as said, lived in the 11th century. Um, um, toward the turn of the 12th century. He was born in what is today Eastern Persia, and he spent a lot of time in Baghdad. He also traveled to Damascus, and um, he went on a pilgrimage. What is so important about him is that he worked on the different disciplines. He grew up and as a theologian. But he also worked a lot on philosophy, on the philosophical tradition of Aristotelian theology. And he also wrote a, a, a contradiction, which was completely misunderstood, especially by Western scholars in the 19th century. When my discipline, Islamic studies, was established in Europe back then, this happened under colonialism because back then it was thought that in Islam uh, philosophy declined in the 12th century. Today, however, we know and we can see very clearly that this was a, um, a colonialist uh, construct because if a philosophy in Islam was part of a culture and if it uh, declined in the 12th century, of course, it had to be um, brought back to Islamic culture. And that happened in the 19th century, according to Islamic scholars, uh, due to the process of colonization. So um, it went back from Europe, back into the um, Islamic world. And uh, behind this is the history um, of a philosophy of Hegel, who believed that uh, the um, a uh, Weltgeist um, came about in Greek. Then he spent some time with. Then then um, uh, was 
uh, with the Arabs, then went back to Europe and needed to be carried back to the Arab, to the Islamic world as a European philosophy. Today, we clearly see the limitations of these explanations in the history of philosophy. And if we look at the details, we find that Al-Ghazali did not um, uh, rebut um, or disprove um, uh, philosophy, but he showed the limits of rationality. To him, it really mattered to show that in the classical philosophical tradition of Islam, rationality came to conclusions that were critical towards religion, but that um, went beyond what we call pure reason. And this is where Al-Ghazali and his uh, decisive, his crucial role comes in, not only in Islam, but in the entire history of philosophy, which then led to this new uh, kind of a philosophy 50 years after his death in the in 1150, which led to the period which I call the post-classical period. Okay, so in other words, the famous argument, I mean, they didn't know each other personally, but the younger um, um, read the elder one between um, Al-Ghazali and um, Avicenna Ibn Rushd. Al-Ghazali uh, wrote a book about the confutation of philosophy, and Ibn Rushd answered with a book, The uh, Confutation of the Confutation. So that this argument, this dispute, that is very well known to Islamic scholars in the West, was not that important, was not that meaningful, uh, that crucial, as was commonly believed. Yes, exactly what happened in my discipline is that Al-Ghazali was read through the eyes of Averroes. So Al-Ghazali, in many aspects, was um, was thought he was the one who killed a philosophy because he confuted a philosophy. It was thought that he destroyed the tradition of a Greek philosophy, whereas Averroes is the one who tried to preserve it, um, but who failed in his project. And uh, there are many topoi in all of that that uh, seem to be fitting to us uh, in the West, the fact that a philosopher works and fights against the power of religion, but fought. We know Galilei, we know Giordano Bruno, and many others, and Averroes was a little bit seen in uh, as having this position. Historically, this is not compatible with the sources I have. Uh, Averroes is an Islamic theologian himself. He was part of uh, the al a movement of renovation in Islam. It's uh, far more complex. And in the dispute between the two books, uh, the confutation of philosophy and the confutation of the confutation, it was basically about the limits of what philosophy can do. And if we look at all of this today with our eyes, uh, after having read Kant and other philosophers of the Enlightenment, we have to admit that Al-Ghazali had the clearer view for the limits of rationalism, which we know much better today than um, Averroes back then. This is very exciting. And therefore, my question from Ahmed, uh, to Ahmed Milad Karimi, does Al-Ghazali mean something for you today, for your thinking? And do you share the view of Frank Griffel that this clear separation between the um, the two does not even exist, that there is no such dispute? I can very well understand what uh, Frank Griffel just explained now and just told, now, told us now. Al-Ghazali, to me, is something to practice philosophy in the spirit of Islam. He plays a key role, an eminent role. We cannot do without Al-Ghazali. You mentioned Kant. Well, Al-Ghazali, in his criticism, especially um, uh, seems to represent, uh, to criticize um, uh, metaphysics, uh, but vehemently, very fiercely, like the um, emanation theory. For Al-Ghazali, this was not well 
um, explained, and this is the beauty of Al Ghazali's thinking. He doesn't just say that I don't like it because it doesn't. Um, fit in with the Quranic theory of God who created the world, but he can show in in a very rational way that uh, the thinking has its limits and Avaros will be the one and exactly it makes it more complex. Avaros will be the one who shows well uh, that uh, the theory of emanation is not philosophy. It's a very special kind of philosophy and it's not Aristotelian at all. So that's a mistake of Al-Ghazali, who means to have criticized philosophy. However, he only criticized a special kind of philosophy that I also criticize. So mistake is that he moved too far away from Aristotle. So Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and so on. And there's another philosophy he would have, uh, he would have liked. Well, what comes clear? Well, I totally share this, but what becomes clear from your words is that uh, this was a discussion inside philosophy. We have to do with the three different, I mean, you mentioned three different political parties, philosophical parties, I'm sorry. So we have the Aristotelian tradition, characterized by neo platism and um, Avicenna against which uh, Al-Razali uh, fights. And if the book is uh, the confutation of um, uh, philosophers, we would have to um, say that he means uh, confuting the, um, the disciples, uh, the, the, the uh, students of his end. And then um, Averroes uh, says, I see myself as a student of uh, Aristotle, of the pure text of Aristotle. And I use uh, Aristotle's arguments against uh, Al-Razali. And it is absolutely true. This is not a conflict between a theology and a philosophy. As was said, all three parties use philosophical arguments. And none of the three parties said it's like that um, because it's written in the Quran. No, all three parties said, OK, I have this position because of this and that argument, because this argument is binding to me. And let me add one more thing. When it comes to confutation, it's tahafut in um, Arabic. And tahafut is maybe um, some more like something that implodes, that collapses within itself. And that's important about Al-Ghazali's project. He doesn't simply want to write a confutation and prove the others wrong. He wants to, to take it all apart from inside. And it shows how his thinking work, as opposed to these broad ideas that think that Al-Ghazali destroyed philosophy, which he didn't do. Not also, not, not least because in his autobiography, he writes, writes that it would be fatal to think and to say that uh, philosophy is harmful or has no, um, is not useful as at all. No. He, but he says that there needs to be arguments, uh, rational arguments, and uh, this is key. I exactly, the, um, the English translation of Tahafud is incoherence. A better German translation would be doing something without having prepared it, overestimating oneself, rushing something. And this is what he, what he blames um, Avicenna for. They say, OK, you think that by using rational arguments, you could say things about God. And Al-Ghazali proves that a pure reason cannot do something like that. I mean, there is a very clear relationship to Kant. But an anecdote that you might know even better, um, well, on the Tahafut of Al-Ghazali, on the very first page, uh, he says that he uses a quote from um, the Nicomachic ethic, we like Plato, but we prefer truth. So basically, he blames the Avicennes that the, they do not follow this, um, which is like Aristotle says, my teacher is my teacher. He tells Plato, but the truth is more important. And uh, this is exactly what we find so important in religion. Uh, the authorities, we may call them whatever we want, but the truth is more important. And this is something that is common to all three traditions. 
Well, Al Ghazali basically seems to seems to remind us of Kant, as we have as we have already mentioned, by pointing to the limits of philosophy. However, Al Ghazali is also known as someone. who blends and who reconciled Islamic philosophy with the mysticism because there are um, mystic oeuvres. One is even translated in German, well, you wrote a light over light, Licht über Licht, and this all draws on the famous light verse in Quran. And there is one famous quote from Al-Ghazali that I would like to read out to you. I think it's from his autobiography. which makes it clear what different kinds of uh, knowledge uh, there can be. One is rational, it's the area of philosophy, and then mystic is uh, the area of a tasting. And he asks, and what a difference is there between knowing the definition of a drunkenness um, and being drunk uh, oneself, Al-Ghazali writes, only to continue that uh, the tasting is um, like uh, looking and uh, touching something, and that you can only find uh, through mystics. How does this blend in what we have just said? And where does um, uh, Ghazali, Al-Ghazali come in here? Well, this is closely related to his um, critique of philosophy, his critique of a philosophical tradition that goes far beyond what he thinks a philosophy can really do. He says, um, the knowledge of God is not something you can derive from philosophy. You derive it from reading, for example, from reading the divine um, revelation. There is a discussion in Islam on how you can tell a true prophet. It's a very important question for um, all the revealed religions. How can we tell the real prophet uh, from the false prophets? The religions differ in this. Um, Judaism and um, the Christendom say, for example, that Muhammad is not a true prophet. And there is a huge discussion going on on this, and Al-Ghazali there shows an entirely new way. And he said in Islam, this is done with um, the, the miracles, um, with the wonders performed. And Al-Ghazali said, no, this is kind of an inner perception, which he calls tasting. It's an inner perception, like, I mean, you read the text, the text of the Revelation, the text of the uh, Quran, and by reading, in reading the text, something changes. The character of the person changes. You um, become a better person, and this becoming a better person, Al-Ghazali calls tasting. It's a reaction that can be performed in different ways by becoming ecstatic, like some Sufis, but also, for example, by starting to reflect about the text. But by, in any case, receiving something that goes beyond the text, that goes beyond rationality, which he calls tasting. And Al-Ghazali, when he says that um, the, the drunken being drunk, a drunkenness, is something that a doctor can recognize by reading books and texts and can diagnose by reading books, but it says something entirely different if you perceive it, if you live it, and if you are into that status, in, in that state. Um, Ahmad Milad Karimi, you teach this. This is uh, one of the focuses of your work. Exactly. Al-Ghazali says something really important, even for us today who have read Kant. He said, that there can be no rational argument for the fact that there can be understandings um, that cannot be performed by reason itself. So basically, he said there can be forms of um, the knowledge of recognition which we cannot achieve rationally. 
So rationally, I cannot exclude the fact that there cannot be other forms of knowledge. And he, if he speaks about tasting, I would like to add the following. Basically, this leads us to the sense of believing. What is the sense of believing in something? If a philosophy, if, if I can achieve something by pure philosophy, and Al Rasali's definition is his con persuasion is that uh, believing transforms us intellectually. I can believe whatever I want. I will remain. the same, I will remain the same um, the person. I will remain like the same uh, donkey, but mysticism uh, transforms you because uh, something happens in you intrinsically. It's a tasting. It's an entirely new or different form of a Madiva. It's um, perceiving, it's a recognizing something that goes beyond the reason. Sometimes it's even counter-rational, like taking oneself back, not doing what you really want, but uh, giving you room for talking more than me, for something talking a lot. It's very painful, but my character would say, OK, if Mr. Griffel is around, I take myself back. And this is mystic. It's very mystic. This is to tell you that I'm also a mystic. Maybe you could call this experience or experiencing experiencing something in a very lively way. There is a distinction that you make in your book. Basically, there are two words in Islamic tradition for philosophy or philosophers. Falsafa, coming from Greek. And then the Arabic word hikmah, which means something like wisdom. Is there competition between the two? How are they related? Exactly. Well, in the process of writing that book, that was something really important that I learned and which made a lot of things clear to me. At the beginning, I already described that in Islamic studies at the beginning of, or from the beginning of the 19th century on, there was the opinion that, that the philosophical tradition in Islam declined in the 12th century. Today, we know that this is not true. However, we have to explain how it can be that large Islamic scholars, especially of the German tradition, like Ignaz Goldzier, for example, Helmut Ritter, who were really um, um, excellent scholars of Islamic studies, who draw a lot of excellent conclusions. How can it be that they made such um, a big mistake? And there, the development of the word for philosophy in Arabic has been really key, has been really crucial. Up until Al-Ghazali, as a matter of fact, a falsafa was the name for the Aristotelian and Neoplatonic tradition of philosophy in Islam that was translated from Greek into Arabic. And Al Ghazali then wrote that book, which was named, which he named The Confutation of Philosophers. And for philosophers, he chose philosopha a word that is very closely related to falsafa. If then later on, 50 years later, if a, a few decades later, after Al-Ghazali, the philosophers took up that discussion, from that moment on, the word falsafa to them is no longer attractive to them. Well, they recognize, uh, they accept Al-Ghazali's uh, criticism, and they say, OK, in that falsafa tradition, they went too far. They draw conclusions uh, about God that a pure reason cannot draw. And they said, basically, we do need a new name for the tradition. And the name that came up then was not new at all. It used to be around even before in the philosophical tradition. And especially, and uh, that is really key, the new word, hikmah, wisdom, originally in Arabic, is mentioned several times in the Quran. And uh, therefore, the blame that in the philosophical tradition that it's something foreign, something Greek, um, was then um, uh, tackled by that way. A uh, Harvard colleague who worked on this 20, 30 years ago said that it was like the 
uh, nationalization, the incorporation of philosophy into the Islamic tradition. First, there was a translation of a philosophy, and then there was the integration into the Islamic tradition uh, with Avicenna. And the last step was a kind of a naturalization, a naturalization of philosophy. So basically, the Greek passport, the Greek passport. Um, was to be transformed into something purely Arabic. The philosophers, um, formerly called a philosopher, were called hikama, and those were the words used from then on. And this explains why great Islamic scholars like Goldseer or Ritter, why they drew the wrong conclusion that after the end of the use of the word falsafa, the traditional philosophy in Islam declined. Well, in five minutes, I will give you the opportunity to ask questions. If you have urgent questions, if there is something you absolutely want to know, use the, this unique opportunity. However, the transformation of the word, well, well falsify me. The, the new word for falsify is wisdom, which does not mean that the Greek tradition is interrupted, but it is continued under a new name, under a new address, basically. And a question for you, Frank Karimi, how do you, how do you see this? How do you perceive this? Could you go so far as to say that because in Europe, the ancient philosophy went to Byzantium, but then in, it was forgotten in, um, and it was rediscovered only by the Arabs and then found its way back through Renaissance, basically. It had to be rediscovered, so there was that interruption this rupture, whereas this rupture seems not to have existed in Islam if the philosophical tradition, if that ship continued sailing under the new name, under Hikmah. Well, was the ancient heritage preserved much better? Was the philosophy understood much better than in the West, which also thinks our origins are in the Greek tradition? Exactly. This is exactly the way it is. And there is historical evidence for this. In the late uh, ancient ages, there were two schools in uh, Athens and Alexandria. And we have, to ac we have access to what they did there because uh, the philosophers are known, so Platon. Um, is held in higher esteem than of Aristotle. And then they had a very special kind of philosophy. They did not philosophize like in ancient times uh, with questions. Think of the Platonic dialogue. No, you write um, commentaries. In the Islamic context, let's think of Al-Kindi, who has already been mentioned for the very first time in Arabic lang in the Arabic language. They really philosophize originally. Something starts burning. Something starts flaming up. This is true, genuine philosophy. It's not a commentary of the commentary. Um, um, no, they philosophize. Even Ibn Sina Avicenna, who is often criticized, is an original thinker, and he attacks. Um, Aristotle, where he is usually not attacked in his logic, in his ontology, and he developed his own ontologies. This seems to me to have been extremely fruitful, especially for the times back then. So basically, the Greek philosophy is not that Greek, and this is an argument against the Hegel and Heidegger who think that um, uh, philosophy has a nation and a culture. But uh, it's uh, for them to, to gain insight into evidence. Therefore, it's nothing Greek. Maybe it's something human, because humans, humankind, um, on the quest for truth, gain evidence. This is the one thing. But then, in the um, even. In the poetry, um, Hikma is continue. Well, even those who take uh, clear distances, like Abdul Kadir Bidem, an Indian Persian poet, or Malana Rumi, who is uh, much better known here, they said um, we don't ha hold philosophy in high esteem, but they perform in their Masnavi 
uh, philosophy at a very high level, so there is really some kind of nation naturalization. Okay, if you have questions, now is the room for questions. Please raise your hands, otherwise I will ask Frank Riffle. Yes, please, here in front. Very, thank you very much for this exciting and inspiring discussion. There is a question that comes to mind. You said that philosophy continued. I also studied philosophy in Göttingen, and I asked myself, well, there must be works. Where this becomes evident. Can you name works? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. The series of works in the post-classical traditions is very long. There is a very long list of Fakhnadin al-Razi, al-Mabakhid al-Mashaki, al-Matali ba'aliya, Taj Kaprizade in the Osmanic tradition. And the list could be continued with my students. We look at those traditions and we come across ever new works. Many works are available only as manuscripts. And as a matter of fact, this goes back to the 19th century, especially in the South um, Asian context in India. We come across works that were written about philosophy, about traditional philosophy, until in the 70s of the 18th century, my Bud, 19th century, my Budi, for example, is a name that plays uh, an important role in um, Iran. But why was this tradition then interrupted? Well, this is something we don't have a lot of time left. Well, we would need another 50 minutes to discuss this. Um, it, this is the process of a colonization, the fact that the institutions of higher education in Islam that the madrasa develops, that uh, the madrasa disappears, excuse me. And then in the next step, in the colonial tradition, polytechnics, and then universities were established in those countries, which totally changed the tradition of philosophy there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also to the interpreters in the booth, Carmen Grau, into English, and Mustafa Asleiman, who translated into Arabic. As you can imagine, that was not an easy feat because we used a lot of philosophical terms. We are here at the book fair. The formation of post classical philosophy will be published uh, on the 10th December uh, with Oxford University Press and it will be more affordable, well, not as a hardback. Well, the hardback is not uh, something you would buy as a gift uh, to a friend, but the soft coffer would be available for $35, maybe 30 euros. Okay, it's twice um, the hourly minimum wage. But then Ahmed Milad Karim, you published God 2.0. It's not as crazy as it sounds. It's a wonderful book. How much would it cost? Seven euros. <laughs> oh, that's quite an offer, and it's quite a bargain. It was published with a reclam. Reclam, I mean, reclam, they do those uh, tiny. Um, th those tiny volumes. You also have a book with Revlam, Thinking Islam, Den Islam Denken, published in uh, 2017 in that rainbow colored uh, edition of Reklam. Okay, very good idea, recommendation. See the Reklam booth um, in hall 3.0 or 3.1. Thank you very much for your attention.